I'm not gonna get. Thank you. So who remembers how did we learn arc links in calculus two class? We gave you like bazillion formulas about calcul about arc links. Remember? Um, Which one did we do? Ooh, I didn't open up to it. No, this one. Yes. Yes? It says that we did the dishwasher and the shell vacuum. Yeah, yeah, that's different. Oh, dishwasher, that's dishwasher, <laughs> wash, <laughs> no, no. washer method. Washer method and then. I like dishwasher better. This was to find volumes. <laughs> but remember how did we do arc links? So I showed you this picture in Calculus 2 class. Ideally, if you see a snake and you want to see how long it is, it would be nice if you catch it and it's not going to bite you. And mm -hmm. then you make it flat and then you use a ruler, right? So that's the ideal situation. But most of the time you cannot. How would you find the arc lengths of the height, the stream of the kite is space? So it's right in the air or something in the space. You need to know how to find arc lengths or all kinds of shapes without actually touching it and making it aggressively flat when it doesn't want to. So, the formula was, if you remember or not, a square root, derivative squared plus derivative squared, and then integral from A to B. That was the arc length from A to B. Here is the picture. We want to find the length of this red curve. Who remembers the idea? How did we do it? What did we use to approximate it? So, someone mentioned washer's shell method that was 3D approximation, but 2D, that is in 2D. How, how did we do it? Any ideas? Yes. We cut it up into smaller and smaller pieces. Exactly. We cut it up into smaller and smaller pieces called seg segments. And when we did that, like so, we see it's in 3D. When we did that, those smaller pieces were approximations, these segments. They were approximations. And we were like, oh, these smaller pieces can be, be even smaller. So they made, they gave better approximations. And then better and better, the smaller it gets, the better it gets. That's how limit showed up. Limit when the size of the segment was shrinking to zero. Limits turn into integral. So arc links is, suppose the curve has the vector equation f, g, and h. Then the curve is traveled once as t increases from a to b. And we can find it using these equations. Same thing as in calculus 2 and 2D, we just add in one more variable. So derivative squared, derivative squared, and just one more derivative squared in the third dimension. Everything is square root integral from A to B. Because of the limit, if you remember an approximation, little things were added together, that gives you integral. Does the second equation remind you anything? Or you want the first one? From that point of view, does this remind you something? What is that? It's like a magnitude. It's a magnitude. So technically speaking, it's just magnitude of r prime. Oh. It's exactly the same. That's how you find the size of the vector. It's a square root and then square plus square plus squared, but it's derivative here. So it's the same thing. I was just teaching this lecture in different calculus three class because I'm substituting professor at eight in the morning, and it was dead quiet. Very quiet people. They don't want to talk to me at all. That was that was weird. That was weird. Our seven thirty a.m. class is quieter. Even quieter. So tired. <laughs> I did not wake up so early today. I did not like that at all. So you don't have to write everything. This is a nice picture here. How we did that. You see, they use vectors here. But still, idea is the same. We're approximating the length of the arc in 3D. <coughs> Example, I wanted to ask you what is it, but then I forgot it actually says, find the length of the helix. So I asked other students, do they understand why it is helix? And they said, no. You see, because I did explain you last time, why do we know it's helix? Let me remind you again, two sine and two cosine gives you a circle with the radius two. So it's in 2D, it's supposed to be a circle. If the third coordinate is zero, it's just a circle in 2D. But because the third coordinate representing the kind, by the way, Z, is not zero, moreover, it's increasing to plus infinity, increasing to minus infinity. The circle which is supposed to enclose were not, was not able to enclose. It was keep growing up and down with time. And that's what helix is. This is pretty cool animation, which actually also explains what we just did with this slinky idea. 
how interesting that it can be flat in 2D, but it's a sphere in 3D, or even double sphere, when I showed you. This is what helix is. It's cosine with respect to x. If you look at it from the respect of x, t plane, it's cosine. It's sine on y axis. And it's a line on the z axis, because it's y equals 3t, z equals 3t. So very interesting. This gives you circle, but this forces the circle to break and go up and down. So you see everything is in perspective. If you look at this shape from the top or the bottom, it's just a circle. Now, so what we are asked here is, let's find the length of the helix. How would you do that? Just use the formula we just gave you, which I wanted. Yeah, lost it. That's fine. The thing is, I don't have a pencil with me. I should start calling people to like actually write down things for me, right? That would be nice. Do you want? Who has a stylus with? Oh, I don't. That'd be nice. Do you want to try? Yes. Go ahead. Also, my handwriting is terrible. Well, I mean, you can you volunteer twice in a day. Here. Mm, oh, it doesn't no, work. No, it doesn't work. Wait, wait, maybe... I think you have to connect it, no? Yeah, yeah. I think so. That's you can use the whiteboard. There yeah. is... Yeah. This one. No. There is a way to write down... Oh, here it is. Try again. Nope. But with a finger, it works. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. 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 you have to... Try again, try again, try again. No, so with no, my finger it works. Yeah. I think you just might have to pair it up. Yes? There's the whiteboard of the marker. Oh, whiteboard is. I think I have one if you want one. Let me try. But I don't want to take away from the notes. That's actually good. Let's see. Yeah, so sad. I hope it's still in that room. Oh, it works. But don't you need it? Thank you. I do have a spare one, but the battery died there. <laughs> so it's a bad coincidence. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, perfect. Oh, look at that. So we need just to use the formula. The formula says arc length, let's call it L. It's a very uh, old thing we did. Integral from 0 to 6 pi. Remember, the moment you put 0 to 6 pi, that fixes the um, parameter of integration, so it's going to be dt. That is important because soon we're going to learn double and triple integrals with dz, dm. So you need to know which one corresponds to which one. 0 and 6 pi are about t, so it should be dt. Then a huge square root. And then you start differentiating and squaring each parameter. Squaring dt. Like so. What is the first one? I'm, remember, I'm differentiating. Negative 10 sine of 5 t. Negative 10 sine 5t. Anyone have questions? Why? So I'm differentiating the first um, component of the vector. Differentiating the second one gives me what? 10 cosine 5 t. 10 cosine 5 t. Since we're squaring negative, it's not important. And the third one, derivative gives you three. And now I'm just going to remind you how to calculate this fast. So it's going to be from zero to six pi, the square root, factoring out 100, which is 10 squared, right? 10 squared. I will have sine squared 5t plus cosine squared 5t plus three times three, nine. Why this is good? Because who knows? One. Yay, this is one. That's what you want to have. Even though it's 5t, remember, it still works because sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta gives you one. So you just end up with the integral 6 pi of 10. No, it's square root of 109 dt. 100 plus 9. And then I asked students in my previous class, like, so what is that? And nobody told me. It's just, it's just 109. Maybe they just did not want to talk, but maybe they forgot. Do you remember? The what? What is the integral of 100? Oh, uh, it's 109. Wait. And then what? 1 divided by 6 pi. So people actually saying right things. Multiply by 6 pi. Or I can do t bar from 0 to 6 pi. And now I'm plugging the top minus the bottom. Remember that? Top minus the bottom. 
square root of 109 times 6 pi minus 0. But in general, people remember that the answer will be your coefficient times the length of the interval, which is 6 pi. 109 times 6 pi. And that is the answer, arc lengths. <laughs> yes? Can we put together? Yeah, you can, why not? I just don't really mind. So, this is what's a short thing. I don't even know if it's worth to put in the exam, to be honest, because it's kind of old material. What's new is about how smooth curves are. So, don't forget to take it back. I might forget to give it back. Yes? Mm -hmm. Very interesting idea about smoothness of curves. So, we already had some kind of um, unusual ideas in this class. How parallel curves are? That is a weird question. We answer it with a dot product. Dot product gives you the answer how parallel curves, uh, two vectors are. Then, we was like... Cross product, that will give me how perpendicular curves are. So calculus 3 actually def defines pretty cool ideas. Now let's answer how smooth things are. Yes. Uh, can you scroll up for just a second? I, I thought the integral of cos is positive. Oh, we're not, like, no? We're not integrating these, we're differentiating it's, these. It's terrific. Oh, right. So derivative uh, I is. I saw the end Yeah, yeah. Oh, and also very nice to show in the picture. Since I noticed, we did find the area, the length of this piece only. Again, reminding you, this is z, this is x plus u, and this is y. T is not in the picture, so I'm reminding you that t is being a fourth dimension here. T is time. So you're like you're looking at your watch, and then while you're looking at helix, is being built. So you're like, okay, stop at 6 pi, and this is what I want to find. So pretty cool that we're actually working in four dimensions for a while already. More interesting idea, uh, what is smooth and not smooth curve? So very nice question because it's nice to work with smooth curves. Look how cute this is. Look at this, why this uh, little ducky has ears like an alien, <laughs> and why it has wheels. Oh, so I don't know, but it's very cute. That's great. I should show it, I'll show it today in my calculus one class. Look how cute it is. So you remember this. But it's going up, then you get this positive, then zero, then negative, then zero, then positive. This looks like a smooth drive. So all these phrases you used, oh, that was very smooth when some diver made a triple flip and then jumped into the water. You're like, this was very smooth. What does it mean to be smooth from the scientific point of view? STEM majors should know that. Smoothness has definition, actually. This ride, this ducky has, looks like smooth. What do you think it will not be very smooth? If, for example, from this side, they will like a cookie. <laughs> Probably that would not be very smooth ride anymore. So, intuitively, you kind of can imagine this. Smooth and not smooth curves, right? Smooth, we just saw the ducky traveling. Not smooth, that would be probably hard. You drive down and then what is that? That would be very hard to test the bicycle. So what do you think, mathematically speaking, we should define? Yes. Um, there's two components to this. One is there's a certain there's a certain number where the the, the slope if it's vastly negative or vastly positive is yeah. very smooth. And the second thing is there's no point on a certain graph where um, the slope equals zero. Yeah. This is very good explanation. Do you have any more ideas on this? Comments? Yes? I'd say basically any curve that's not differential. Very good point. So you exactly added to the definition. What they just said, it's nice if derivative exists, because in this case, derivative does not exist. Remember, derivative does not exist at cusps or cor corners. So we should avoid that if you want a curve to be smooth. And also, we do not like when derivative is zero as well. So it should be nicely increasing and nicely decreasing. And I do have a definition here. Just the first paragraph is important. So a curve is called smooth if it has a parameterization on the interval of i such that the derivatives are continuous. We also need to point out that the function doesn't have any breaks, right? So that makes sense. 
not to jump from the cliff. So no jumps. And do not have simultaneously zeros, except maybe at the po end points. So there should not be zeros or D and E. That also is important. You don't have to go write down the definition of the piecewise smooth. Because it means if it's not smooth everywhere, we can break it into pieces. And make sure that on every piece it's smooth. That's what you call sub-in and sub-intervals. A smooth curve will have no corners or cusps. That's the intuition idea we have now. And now, a very interesting idea with circles. I told you in calculus 2 and calculus 1 class that everything can be built with circles. Same idea with the uh, curvature. How curved a line or surface is, how much... You should probably stop it because it goes to the recording. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just realized it because my volume here is very sensitive. Um, how curved a line or surface is? How much a curve varies from being straight or flat? Okay, what if the curve is smooth? Now the question is how smooth it is. And this is how cool mathematicians are. We want to know precisely, okay, you are smooth, but how cool you are. And then we just <laughs> <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> so, if, look at that. If you imagine a big circle, the circle has a definition of it. If you have a big circle and you are traveling on top of that circle, this is a very smooth ride because the circle is so big. But the moment the circle becomes small, that still smooth, but it changed faster than on the big circle. That intuitively gives us the idea, interesting, small circle circles have high curvature and the big circles have small curvature. So it's inverse relationship. With a bigger radius, the curve is smooth. And with a smaller radius, it's actually highly not smooth. But that's a very cool idea because imagine you are like a juggler walking on this circle. This one will be easier to walk than on this one. That's kind of the idea you should think about. So at what point would the circle be too small to uh, count as Too small, point? imagine it will be like this, this tiny, then it will be Yeah, that's what right? I mean. It's like, does so, still kind of smooth? It's not, good it's point. Like instant, at right? some point, it might create a cusp, but probably it's not going to be a cusp because cusp cannot have a circular shape. So it will be tiny like so, but it still doesn't count as a cusp. Cusp is when derivative stopped existing. It was here, 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 and then changed too rapidly. Here, here, here. This one still has derivatives. It's just going to be a tiny one, and it's hard to detect them. So when I was Googling what a curvature is, it gave me some <laughs> medical pictures. If you like, Google images for the curvature, it gave me that. I'm like, OK, I mean, it makes sense, makes sense. Yes. Raise your hand if you have scoliosis. <laughs> so mine is probably like this, to be honest. <laughs> There's three types actually, depending on the curvature of the spine. Yeah, yeah. See, she knows because she takes some medical classes. That's very convenient. Yeah, she's yeah. very smart. Take medical classes. The one that looks like an ass. A curve. So this one is important. Write it down. A curve is <laughs> a curve is called smooth if it has a smooth parameterization. A smooth curve has no cusps and corners. We did this. You don't have to write it down again. What we're writing down is. We're reviewing what tangent is. Do you remember tangent? Tangent is derivative of your function divided by the magnitude of the derivative of the function. So we, der we, we did describe small t. Small t was tangent vector. Tangent vector, as it's supposed to come from the name, is derivative. Derivative tangent, synonyms. But then we realized, remember I showed you those nice vectors on the backpack and stuff? We don't care how big they are, so we want to normalize to make it a unit size. So that's why you divide by the size to create unit vector out of that. So this is where it gets interesting. A curvature, so what is the curvature? That is a definition I wanted you to know. Is a magnitude, magnitude means the length, right? Of the rate of change, so that is t of the unit tangent vector with respect to the arc lengths. So we're using arc lengths in the ratio. We use arc lengths so that the curvature will be independent of the parameterization. And here's the formula below. The formula 
k small k is the international notation for curvature is the derivative of t where t is derivative of r over derivative of r then divided by derivative of s that's your that's the r thing um, with respect to the r and then you take the size of it and this number will show you how smooth the curve is and that's what you call curvature curvature now good and bad things about this topic the bad thing is that the curvature has a billion numbers of formulas and some professors push them hard so only for this topic i can create three four problems on the exam and the good thing is that i don't want uh, curvature is known to be just a nice property which is nice to know it exists but it's not as important to waste so much time on it so I will give you my notes with lots of formulas, but I don't want to spend my time right now talking about them. I will scroll and show you, and then you can copy them to do your homework. But I will mention to you probably on Monday if I did put any questions about curvature on the exam or not. So there's one more formula for the curvature. There's one more formula for the curvature. All is the same thing. Think about that. So yeah, you don't have to do it now. Uh, this so this is getting crazy, and that's why I don't really big fan of it. And there's one more formula. This one has first derivative, second derivative, cross product, and then cubic from the bottom. And all of this is a negative So remember, you should take square roots and stuff. Okay. So that is also one more formula. And you know, some professors like pushing it. I am not big fan of it. What is important is finally to learn this. T vector, N vector, and B. This is a famous trio which we need to know. It's as famous as X, Y, Z, and it's as famous as I, J, K, T, and B. Tangent, normal, binomial. They are the ones who represent everything in 3D. So, this is important. And this is actually one of the most important parts of this week. At the given point on a smooth space curve, there are many vectors that are orthogonal to the unit vector t, tangent to the unit tangent vector. Let's define a normal vector, which will be perpendicular to t. How to define it? Let's take one more derivative. So again, t is already a derivative. Let's take one more derivative, derivative of t. If you imagine t is if you imagine t is velocity, then this is t prime, which is acceleration, if you think about that. Applications. And then, and then make a unit vector out of it, and we're going to call it principal unit vector. Nobody calls it principal. It's just unit normal vector. And then we're going to define binormal. Binormal will be perpendicular to both tangent and normal. How to find that? Using cross product. So we have three vectors now. T, that is tangent. Tangent vector. Tangent comes from the derivative of R over size of R. Now we have N. N comes from the derivative of T over size of T. And now we have B. B is a cross product of two previous ones. So it's perpendicular to both two. And this is actually important. You're definitely going to have it on the exam. Find T and B. It is perpendicular to both T and N. And I'll show you some cool animations right before the quiz. Look at that. So the previous class was very impressed by my animations. And I'm like, your instructor does not show you any. Look at this. T and B. How amazing is that? So the green one is tangent, how do I know? Not only because it's here, but because it's very close to the curve. The one that's almost touching the curve is the other tangent. Tangent is steep, right? So the green one shows you how steep this curve is. Then N is the one perpendicular to the green one, it's called normal one. And red, perpendicular to both of them, called binormal. Those three guys, three characteristics, explain what curve does. Curve is this steep green, this normal blue, and binormal red. It's a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster, yeah. But they do describe lots of properties and lots of stuff. One more. Tell me, what do you think? Is this uh, curve is smooth or not? No, no. I know, it looks very smooth. There's a. 
Well, you see, how do you see the cusp? Uh, what I see will be the you know, this image. How fast it feels, you see? And that's exactly why this trio helps. This trio tells you the behavior of the curve or surfaces and so on. So, you see, it's very smooth here and it flips way too fast. So, some smoothness. It's still smooth. So, I would not even call it a cusp. Maybe it's smooth from that point of view. But it's less smooth than it used to be. Kind of that's the idea. And now, if you zoom in, it looks like this. So in, so first we defined tangent because this is what we know from calculus one class. Tangent, right? This is tangent. Tangent. And then uh, you can write down the formula again if you want. Maybe that will help you to memorize it. Tangent T is derivative of your curve over the size of the derivative. So tangent is derivative, that makes sense, but don't forget to divide by the size. Then we defined normal by just finding the orthogonal vector, n. And n was defined, so that is normal. n was defined. Now let's differentiate t, which is already a derivative actually, and then also make it unit. And finally, the third vector, binormal. Binormal. It's just, bless you, a cross product of two previous ones, t and n. And the cross product, if you remember, is perpendicular to two previous ones. So it's perpendicular to both t and n. Now, all of them create planes, as you can see on the picture on the right. These planes have names, and these planes also represent something. And you will be responsible for finding these planes. So, the one which is touching the curve is the one that has tangent and normal vector. This is called osculating plane. Osculating plane. Osculating plane will be more attached to the curve. And then the normal and binormal vectors, so they create a normal plane. That makes sense from the name. So these two planes look beautifully like so. I think I have, well, it's over here. Like so, when the curve is traveling, so these three vectors are traveling, they're actually dragging with them two planes. Osculating one, osculating plane is this one. It touches the curve because it's tangent and normal. Oscillating comes from Latin, means kissing. So it's kind of kissing the curve. And then this one was created from normal and binormal vector, so it's the one that sticks out away from the curve because it's normal one. So that's what you call normal plane. I will have these definitions for you to have later. Normal plane, osculating plane. Osculating plane means a kiss. So osculum, kiss. Very interesting idea. And finally, the last thing to tell you is about this circle. There's a definition of this osculating circle, which is a little bit also too much information. But I just described to you that we can build a circle, a uh, concave side of C. And then, it looks like so. Pretty cool idea with circles. The circle will be on oscillating plane. The one that touches the curve. That's why there are two vectors here. One is tangent, the other one is normal. And then when the circle keeps spinning, it will create a curve and it will tell you how smooth the curve is. The curvature will be defined with this circle. As you can see, if the circle is big, the curvature is good. If the, circle, the curvature is not that dramatic, so it's smooth. The circle is small, the curvature is high. So this is, I actually showed it to you before, but now we know what it is. A tangent vector is in green. That's the one that touches the curve, kissing the curve, right? Then normal vector is in yellow. That sticks out away from the green. And then the oscillation vector, that's probably what they call the binormal one in blue. This famous trio describes the curve. But there is a scalating circle. A scalating circle is in the plane, in the kissing plane. A scalating plane. So look at it. The circle is small when it makes a turn. 
Everybody takes a turn, the circle shrinks. So the circle represents that something is going to happen, some kind of change, rapid change will happen if it's small. And then when it's very small, the circle is increasing. It gets very big, so it doesn't fit in the picture. Which means the bigger the radius, the smoother the curve is. The smaller the radius, the less it's still smooth, but less smooth the, the curve is. So in engineering, you can predict that something is going to happen using this oscillating circle. If the radius is shrinking, that is a prediction that the turn is going to happen soon. Imagine modeling automatic cars on highways. This is what they do. They build differential equations and they use these ideas to make a prediction for the weather is shaking their surrounding of the car highway. And then if the radius is shrinking on this oscillating plane, there should be some kind of turn happening soon so it should slow down. Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't memorize acceleration, that is not popular in the binomial problem. Is that a very cool idea with the circle? So something's going to happen, the circle is shrinking. That makes sense if you put circles everywhere on the curve, the very nice shape will have each circle, and then the weird shape will have small circles, yes. Are the three vectors like the tangent, normal, and bipolar, are they always perpendicular? To yes, other? they're all perpendicular to each other, just like x, y, z. That's why they are so fascinating. So I will give you some definitions here. And final last thing to show you. See, I was looking yesterday for all of this cool stuff. Again, circles, look at that. Very smooth, the circle is huge. And then it takes the turn, the circle is shrinking. Very big circle because it's very smooth. And then it becomes very small because of the turn. And then it increases. So this is, again, three vectors, T and B. Tangent, normal, binomial, or perpendicular to each other, just as X, Y, Z. But x squared defines the system of coordinates. T and B defines things in 3D. How pretty cool is that? So it takes a coordinate system and sends it into space. That's kind of what we do here. And that's it. Yeah, you see? So it makes sense. That's it before the quiz. So kind of that's what I wanted to show you. Yes? <laughs>